Hello, my friends. Welcome to the Healthy Peaceful Podcast. Thank you for joining me this week as I embark on a series of episodes where I explore awakening the living heart of the healer. We delve into the following topics from articles and video transcriptions by Dr. James Duffy, MD. Why some people are invisible, meaning their suffering is ignored. Strategies to enhance our empathy and ability to respond to the pain of others. The meaning of the words empathy, compassion, and altruism. How other cultures have developed a container to support healing. Why the presence of the healer is pivotal to the healing process and a consideration of the characteristics of presence, silence, authenticity, acceptance, abundance, meaning you can trust the universe to support your needs, timelessness, courage, and humility. The mythological models of the healer and the healer's journey. A lexicon of healing that has meaning. The progression of disease from models other than conventional medicine, where there's an opportunity for healing earlier in the process, when one concedes that there is imbalance, disharmony. The opportunity of the healer to view his or her work as a sadhana, a spiritual practice, how this is supported by a healthcare paradigm that supports right relationship with ourselves, one another, our earth, the universal spirit. The four pillars of healing, compassion, wisdom, competence, and self-cultivation. A recognition that human flourishing, not merely the absence of disease, is the ultimate destination. Join me as I interview guests who I'm hoping will encourage us to confront the shadow of healing in our communities and find ways to transcend this shadow through contemplative practice and action. By nourishing the inner while considering the outer, there is an opportunity for healers to awaken to the living heart of healing. Welcome today, Dr. Duffy. Thanks, Noreen. Thanks for inviting me. Awesome. Yeah, so I just want to start out by, um, you know, just a brief bio of your background, you know, how you came to, um, I know you've had a varied career and 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 you've um, forayed into a number of different areas of medicine, uh, but just a little bit about your background, uh, where you started, uh, what brought you to this work? Uh, and um, and then we'll we'll dive right in. Great, thanks. So I'll make it real brief. I um, people are always asking me where I'm from, even though I've been in the United States for almost forty years. Um, I, I think I should have worked harder at getting rid of my accent. But um, but um, I'm from all over. My I grew up um, in England, the Middle East, and mostly in Africa, Southern Africa. What was Rhodesia and became Zimbabwe. Um, I, I, um, my, I, I'll stick to my professional journey. It's, uh, I, I, I trained initially as an internist, um, then uh, moved into a diagnostic radiology. Uh, we could talk a lot about why I did that, but it really wasn't for me. And, and I recognized that I was really drawn to understanding people's stories and how I could be a, a productive part of those stories. And so I made a leap of faith um, the, and uh, started training in psychiatry at Brown, and uh, absolutely immediately I started. I knew I loved it, and uh, but also very quickly recognized that whilst I valued and appreciated psychodynamic theory um, and even psychopharmacology within its limits, I I also realized very quickly that I needed to understand more about the brain, it as a structure, as a, as an organ, and so. Um, then the training in behavioral neurology and became an academic neuropsychiatrist um, for 15 years or so. Um, um, but uh, despite my myself, I find myself increasingly drawn into late 1990s, hard to believe that palliative medicine didn't even exist in the United States as a distinct specialty. I and mean, there was only one palliative care service in an academic center. Of course, we, we had hospice and, and in this country um, much before that, but it was really a totally distinct world from mainstream quote unquote medicine defined by Medicare um, benefit. And, and I got to know many of the early founders of hospice in this country 
Florence Wald and Ed Overhull and others at Yale and just wonderful people. So, but but anyway, um, I find myself getting more and more into palliative medicine. We can talk about how that happened. And then spent the next 10 years um, working to support the evolution of palliative medicine um, to a distinct discipline for better or worse, something we can talk about um, within healthcare. And uh, I did that for about 10 years and then, um, then became more engaged with what's called integrative medicine. Um, and uh, so I spent the last 10 years or so really engaged with that, learning classical Chinese medicine um, and trying to develop models around that. And I, and I would say my greatest passion right now is um, working with uh, clinicians, healthcare professionals around this um, challenging issue of burnout and, uh, and which actually is an extension out of my work in palliative medicine. Um, but burnout, as you know, is reaching pandemic levels. Uh, three quarters of CEOs of healthcare organizations now re rate burnout as the number one challenge facing their organizations. And, and yet we have very little uh, to demonstrate as, as being effective. Um, and actually, I, I do believe that my experience in palliative care has really helped to inform me around some ways in which we can begin to address this, this issue of burnout. Um, and it's, uh, so that's my, that's my journey. I'm, and I'm currently, um, I just left academic medicine full time. I was a professor of clinical psychiatry at UCSF until about 18 months ago. And I'm now working with a wonderful group here in Connecticut um, where I work as an integrative neuropsychiatrist in a neurosciences institute. Um, particularly with people with movement disorders like Parkinson's disease. Um, so, uh, and, I, and I continue to learn from them. Um, so that's what I'm doing right now. Wonderful. Wow, that's, that's, that's quite a um, diverse career. Um, medicine or healing being the common, common thread, but um, Although it may seem like things are unrelated, it, certainly it, it seems like your cu curiosity brought you from one place to another and, and to a place where you felt you needed to go deeper uh, in your understanding of healing. Yeah, I think that's true. You know, I, I make, I, when I introduce myself to my patients, I say um, I'm called an integrative neuropsychiatrist, but essentially I'm a psychiatrist who's really worked throughout my career to learn new tools that I can have in my toolbox. Um, that, you know, if all you have is a hammer, then everything becomes a nail, right? And of course we see that in psychiatry where everything is now becoming psychopharmacological and that's how we're training future psychiatrists. But, but so my hope is that um, I can engage with people at whatever level um, that's gonna be helpful to limit, remediating their suffering. Um, and sometimes that's, you know, sitting with a family and doing some family systems work, or it could be placing a needle in a uh, gallbladder 20 point on the back of your right, neck. Right, right. You know, or it sure. could be finding a medication that will help you to sleep because mm -hmm. nothing else is working. So basically just wanted to have more tools in my toolbox and, uh, and having to be radically honest with myself about the limitations of my toolbox. And, and I'm sure, yeah, yeah. I hope that by the time I finish my work, I would have identified another tool that I need to learn, learn because there's a lot more tools that. Uh, that no, that's I, great, that's yeah. great. Mm -hmm. I know that, um, I believe in, in some of the reading that I've done regard that, you know, some of the video transcripts and things uh, about you online, that you are a, a practitioner or a student of Tibetan Buddhism? That's correct, yeah. Okay. Um, could I, do you mind me asking how that has influenced your um, practice of medicine, uh, your view of healing, um, how, and also your work with healthcare professionals? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, first of all, I'm a very a student of small capacity. You know, there's small, medium, large capacity. So okay, I'm okay. small capacity student, I, I do my best. And uh, um, so I engaged with, you know, Buddhist teachings like, I can remember growing up in Southern Africa, just really uh, feeling a connection to these Eastern traditions, but 
in those days, there was almost, especially in Africa, there was almost nothing available to me. If I was to go into a library, they, they, I think Paul Brunton's books were the only books around the East. Uh, and of course, the, the, the Bhagavad Gita. Um, but it was, I really engaged fully when I came to the United States. Uh, I remember my first formal engagement was at Brown where there actually was a Zen group that there's the Providence Zen Center which is quite quite well known and, and we sat in the circle and our teacher was actually a history, professor of quantum physics <laughs> at Brown and I thought well this is going to be great we're going to have some great conversations um, but all we would do is sit and uh, and I remember the torment I had as, as I wanted to ask all these questions um, but so Zen is wonderful but for me what really brought me to the Tibetan tradition was um, the centrality of the heart, um, compassion um, to their teachings. Um, this is, really, it is a radically engaged Buddhism, right? And so what I found surprising early on actually was that um, probably the most dominant influence on end-of-life care in the United States has come through Tibetan Buddhism. Um, that started with uh, Sojo Rinpoche's famous book called Tibetan Book of Living and Dying, which was a play on the Tibetan book of uh, the Bardo. Yeah, yeah, that's a wonderful book. I, I've read that book. Yeah, and so actually that that came out and um, it was very quickly seized upon by the hospice community and, um, and by the beginnings of palliative medicine, although it wasn't really formally talked about, I, I was fortunate enough to be invited to work with a wonderful teacher called Christine Longacre. Christine wrote the book called Facing Death and Finding Hope, Facing Death and Finding Hope. And uh, this was a book that Christine was a member of the, of the Rigpa Sangha, Tibetan Buddhist Sangha, and had journeyed with her own young husband through his dying very young, and she was a hospice nurse. And, and she wrote this book um, about her experiences, but most of all, a book about practical Kind of advice and insights about being a caregiver with somebody who's who has a terminal illness and so she developed something called the spiritual caregiving uh, program it's still going spcare.org i think um and uh, kirsten deleo just wrote a wonderful book on caregiving uh, kirsten deleo i think it's d-e-l-e-o um so um i became part of that teaching faculty and we basically um provide a kind of a graduate level training in contemplative end of life care, contemplative end of life care. Mm -hmm. And um, at play, wonderful places like, you know, Shambhala up in, in Colorado and the mountains. So I did that for a number of years. And, and what I've witnessed over time, you know, with this intersection of, between the Tibetan Buddhist, um, I would say worldview and palliative medicine has strengthened, although not always formally, um, so um, maybe I'll share a story with you. I think what really trans really embedded me, I think, um, in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition was um, a talk that I heard from His Holiness the Dalai Lama um, that kind of changed my life. Um, and not a very long talk. It was a, he was the keynote speaker at the world's what was coined the world's first uh, conference on Congress on Tibetan medicine. It was in Washington, DC. It was around 99, I think. Um, and uh, so I was very excited to go to this and, and um, His Holiness was giving the keynote and because, well, you know, obviously a lot of people wanted to go, they needed to actually have us all be bussed off to a larger auditorium in the city. Several thousand people attended and uh, we had to wait several hours before he was able to come on stage because of the secret service and all the stuff that goes with that. But the moment came and there was great anticipation as he came on stage and brought his presence with him. And uh, after a few moments of reflection, and I'm gonna give you the whole talk right now. Um, Wonderful. He's, yeah, he said, uh, they've asked me to give a keynote um, on Tibetan medicine. And he said, I'm afraid I know absolutely nothing about Tibetan medicine, <laughs> and so therefore I really don't feel like I'm in a position to <coughs> giving you a talk about it. Okay. Uh, he said, however, there are two things I want to say. The first is that this is not the first Congress on Tibetan medicine. That was held more than 500 years ago. 
um, in Tibet at the instruction of the king. And, and they brought together all of the world's tra healing traditions, teachers, um, to have a conference on how these could be distilled into a medicine that would be of most benefit to people. And he said, the other thing I want to say <clears throat> is that the most important thing about uh, being a healer to being a physician is to have a good heart. And he said to have a good heart. Most important thing is to have a good heart. And beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. Said, and that's my talk. <laughs> and, I, uh, and he was serious. That was his talk. And, <laughs> and he said, but I'll take some questions. Um, at that point, uh, a lady threw herself on the stage wearing, uh, she was wearing a white robe, I'm not sure, but she was whisked off by the Secret Service. And another person in the, in the audience began to shout out questions related to quantum physics and would not take no for an answer until she was essentially <laughs> found out by the, uh, by the audience. Ironically, I find myself sitting next to that person at a silent retreat just a month later. <laughs> well, well that, was a, that was an exercise in... in um... Uh, working with your own irritations, perhaps, or, or yeah. patience. Yeah, everything is a teaching, right? So, but anyway, what he, what I realized, I was first very annoyed, actually. I had gone all that way and sat for hours, and what I got was, you know, a one-minute talk. <clears throat> but actually, when I went back to, to my hotel room, I realized that he had challenged me with a question that I hadn't been asked before mm. as a healer, which is, do I have a good heart? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. And so um, that was an uncomfortable question. Um, at yeah. That point in my life, I, um, I was, I think I was an associate professor. I might have already been a full professor. You know, I'd had academic credibility, um, you know, doc, best doctors in America list and all that nonsense, right? Papers. But, but I actually, the more I sat with that question, the more I realized that I, probably didn't have a good heart. And I, and I didn't even know what that meant to have a good heart. And so that was really, in, you know, accelerated my own um, professional work and, and, and how could I align it with this wisdom about what it means to have a good heart, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so at that time, I was uh, the head of psychiatry at a very large inner city hospital. And, and what we did was we provided consultations um, in this you know, thousand bed house, 800 bed hospital, um, we would consult essentially on for patients who either were un uncomfortable themselves or making the people around them uncomffortable. And it was really oh, very oh, oh, right? oh, that's, that's a great one. Yeah, so it could have been uh, somebody who had expressed suicidal thoughts when they came in for their surgery or somebody who got I agitated um, or somebody who was simply difficult, challenging, right? Yeah, yeah. And so um, it was actually a wonderful way to actually get inside the underbelly of healthcare and really understand what goes on. Um, but one sure. of the things that I, as I thought about having a good heart, I began to recognize was that I had become blinded um, to the suffering of the people that I had come to serve. Now, um, and, uh, and I have a whole story about that and how I been challenged with that earlier in my life, but but it, once I became, once I actually began to be open to the experience of my patients, first of all, my patients, I began mm -hmm. to recognize their suffering, right? And of course, you know, it doesn't, it seems like a long time ago, it was only 20 something years ago, right? There was no palliative care uh, in medicine and essentially um, my service were the ones who were supposed to deal with suffering at least on un this uncomfortable situations. And yet um, we didn't really have much of a skill set other than our medications, which were often very helpful. I mean, I'm not against appropriate use of medications. Um, but so that brought me into this dialogue more meaningfully with, you know, the nature of suffering, and of which of course is central to Buddhist teachings, right? The first noble truth, mm -hmm. life is suffering, life involves suffering. And, and, and I also realized that, you know, despite my years of education, I'd actually, and my giving an oath, right, the, the Hippocratic oath, relief suffering always, right, I actually didn't have a definition for suffering. And when I went into the textbooks of medicine, you know, Harrison's two-volume textbook, 
close to 2000 pages or Bailey's textbook of surgery, the word suffering does not appear in the index. And so we, we gave an oath to a topic that we actually didn't, you know, we had no knowledge of. And so that's where I got into really understanding this and, my, and the Tibetan tradition helped me with that. And that's when I found myself moving into this field of palliative medicine, which, which was really a professional, uh, was, was a professional suicide mission in many ways. Um, there was no way of being reimbursed for end of life care. Hospice was being delivered by wonderful non nonprofit nonprofit agencies, motivated by their by their compassionate spirit, but within mainstream of healthcare, we, we were blind to that, and, and so we, when people when there was no longer any scientific miracle, we would ship them off to some some strange place called hospice, right, where they would be cared for. We hoped. Um, so so my my relationship. I mean, I have the deepest gratitude um, for the Tibetan people, you know, and how they've kept these teachings alive. Um, you know, the, the, their, their teachings, their diaspora is, unfortunately, they've not been allowed to, to, to find comfort as refugees outside their own country for, because of politics, right? But the, their, their primary diaspora is their, is their spiritual practice, right? Their spiritual tradition. It's a diaspora yeah. that's really moved into virtually all aspects of, of, the, of the globe, right? And we now even mm -hmm. CEOs, um, you know, I'm trained as a, an executive coach, a leadership coach, uh, using contemplative practices to support the, the personal development of leaders as transformative agents. This is now mainstream. This has really become mainstream. So the Tibetan diaspora has been their, their spiritual tradition. And I, and I hope that one day we will be able to find a way to provide support for them as human beings. Um, so moving forward, I think, um, so that's how I got into palliative medicine. It was a professional suicide mission. There was no reimbursement. There was no, there was no department of palliative medicine, no division of palliative medicine. I remember I managed to put together a volunteer palliative medicine team, volunteer in a large hospital and the administration refused to allow it to happen because the wow. concept of having wow. volunteers working with people that couldn't be cured was something that was just too mind boggling, right? It was like, whoa. So it does not right. does not compute. So that led me down to uh, I worked I moved to um, Houston, Texas, and mm -hmm. I said God has a sense of humor. He said, "Okay, you want uh, lots of resources," um, and they said, "You want to talk about end of life care and palliative medicine? You can do it in the most surgically oriented hospital in the world, Michael DeBakey's Hospital. We had 180 ICU beds in the Methodist Hospital, probably still do." Um, he said, you want to talk about doing palliative medicine? You can try and do it there. And he said, you want to talk about spirituality and health? He says, here's an opportunity. You can be the president of the Institute for Religion and Health at the Texas Medical Center, which had been there for 50 years and done wonderful, wonderful work, but had kind of run out of ideas. Um, each generation had, had had an impact in its own way. But the question was, what was the role of an institute for spiritual or religion and medicine in, in the 21st century? So God said, here's, if you want to try it out, here, here's the place, Houston, Texas. So that's where I went. And wonderful, wonderful time. Um, got the program going, um, palliative medicine, and revived the institute. Changed its name with the support of the board to spirituality and medicine. And it's um, and there's a whole story about why I left, but that's not important. Um, I also did a lot of work at MD Anderson Cancer Center, where I had the privilege to really journey with people through their dying, right? And and uh, it's the cancer is a remarkable disease because um, it's almost you know unlike most diseases, the trajectory is so much more predictable for most people. Um, and yeah. so I really had a privilege, the privilege of working with them and being bearing witness to that and, and got um, made wonderful friends and um, uh, but got more and more interested in another tool in my toolbox, which is how can I help things like constipation and nausea, fatigue, right, insomnia and 
you know what, we could have all these amazing chemotherapy agents and bone marrow transplants, but we're not very good at treating constipation. But you know who is? Is, is acupuncturists. And we had some ac wonderful acupuncturists on service and I witnessed them have amazing results. So I said, hey, listen, I, can I spend some time with you when I can find moments and observe your work? And, and then really became enamored by classical, move more and more into the more classical tradition, uh, which is a profoundly spiritual model of, of healing, but also how do we work with lifestyle, you know, movement, environment, space, just tools in the toolbox. So um, that brought me to working um, with, uh, I, I worked for a while out, literally out in the desert for a few years as the, what was called the chief of integrative medicine with a very high end program where I was going to try to educate myself about who gets what, when, how often, and how do you measure it, right? Because there's I 24 different treatment modalities available to me and people with lots of resources. But and was we, this in Texas as well? Or, this or? was in Arizona. This was just okay. outside Tucson, wonderful Tucson. And mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. um, really went there very consciously kind of get another education. And so I had all these resources and the question is, how do I make sense of it? And it was a very interesting time and then decided to take that information and work uh, with Kaiser um, Permanente in the Bay Area and clinical faculty at UCSF to see if we could begin to create some models of integrative medicine um, because it shouldn't just be about wealthy people. Um, integrative medicine doesn't have to be expensive at all. It can actually right. be very, yeah. very, very yeah. cheap, you know, so, but unfortunately that, you know, the, the vis viscosity of the culture is such, and that's a whole other conversation, right? How, how do you actually support change within organizations um, <clears throat> who, uh, have metrics that aren't necessarily aligned with re reduction of human suffering, right? Uh, you know, I often say if we were to make suffering the outcome measure of our healthcare system, we would change the world. <laughs> Think about it, right? I mean, and I actually did a study once that we published looking at the determinants of suffering in people with uh, terminal illness. And what we discovered was their suffering didn't correlate with how sick they were. And it didn't correlate with negatively or positively with whether they were spiritual or religious. It correlated with um, the, the quality of their social support. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Well, in alleviating suffering in the, in the medical system, and, and as you've indicated, there's a, it could be pivotal, I, the, the, the approach to relieving suffering and, and many other aspects on the globe, so. Yeah, and oh, this is what of course Buddhism, right? It's the first noble truth, right? And so it causes us, you know, suffering is part of mm -hmm. life and suffering comes from ignorance and, and attachment, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. so um, that brings me to uh, kind of my work focus right now. Uh, I Part of my clinical work is this issue of uh, clinician wellness and, and the most remarkable, happiest, flourishing clinicians I have ever encountered were many years ago in the hospice movement. I'm, I'm sorry to say that I don't see them flourishing anymore because they have actually been captured by the consciousness of allopathic medicine, right? But in those early well, days... Well, I love that expression, captured by the consciousness. Yeah, yeah. It's you know so it's uh who was it somebody mm, was it Einstein but anyway somebody said that people don't have ideas ideas have people right so um so yes we get captured to the idea yeah. that allows us to organize ourselves around a concept a way of being in the world that we think will keep us safe right. And so mm -hmm. now the most joyous people, you know, I remember going to the best conferences ever in the in the 90s with the Hospice Association. It was wonderful. I mean, people were there were sick people singing and everybody was joy. And now it's like now it's just become another specialty. Right. We always said, don't let palliative medicine become another specialty. It's not right. another specialty. Right. It's a way of being with each other with the people we've come to serve. Um, it's not a specialty, but we've, we've, been, we've been caught captive to this. And so um, for me, a pivotal moment was going on rounds in the intensive care unit 
many, many years ago. And, and we would go through cases and we came to an empty bed in the ICU, not usual to find an empty bed in the ICU, but that bed had just been vac vacated by somebody who had passed. And, and, we, and we spent a few moments, it, which is unusual, mostly when beds are empty, the people and the memories go with them in our culture, right? But actually we spent a few moments just recognizing that person and they'd been on the unit for a long time and it had been a really, really, really hard struggle for the patient, their families, for the staff. Um, and as we talked about it, um, the intensivist in charge of the unit, the ICU doc, actually began to cry. And at that moment, I had this insight that, oh my God, it's not just our patients that are being held hostage to this consciousness, it's our healers. And even the ones that we consider sometimes to be, quote unquote, the perpetrators. Oh, you know, it was this thing in, in Pop Pally, like, oh, we need to train doctors to be more compassionate. We need to change them up to be jerks. I remember having a very public disagreement with uh, Sherwin Newland on, <laughs> on television. It was a PBS special and, and, and she made a statement which was pretty common and he said, listen, you know, the reason that doctors are so insensitive uh, and don't address people suffering is because we choose the wrong people for medical school. They're all nerds and scientific people and that. And I challenged him and I said, you know, the data actually suggests the opposite. If you actually look at the data, um, people who go to medical school score off the charts when it comes to the level of compassion and empathy and the desire mm -hmm. to do good in the world compared to their peers, right? These are really wonderful people. It's true, however, as they go through their training, their um, levels of compassion, empathy actually go down. And I would say that if you look at the curves, we, medical school will turn a woman into a man and a man into a reptile. You know, <laughs> so, you know, so, yeah, so, so, oh my goodness, I have this insight. My, my peers are suffering too. And right. it's almost like, you know, had this window and I started then talking about you know burnout and I remember I had my I, I facilitated the first retreat I did with my friend Tim who was an ex-Benedictine monk uh, a retreat for physician renewal uh, at the Trinity Conference Center in Cornwall Connecticut a wonderful place owned by Trinity Church mm -hmm. and wow you know it was really hard to get people to come um, that was the first insight I had and secondly I had this really incredibly painful insight that being vulnerable was possibly the most dangerous thing any physician could allow themselves to be. And so Yeah, yeah, because it 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 you know it's an unraveling of the paradigm, you know. Yeah. And who am I if I'm not right. control, if yeah. I'm not my intellect? And so of course yeah. that goes back to his holiness and this challenge, you know, do I have a good heart? And so, um, you know, the work I, the work that I have been working with in, in the last 20 years in different environments has been, you know, how do we support um, the emergence of a good heart in healthcare providers where not only does it um, not leave them feeling vulnerable and, and at risk, but actually allow them to flourish in this work of being healers. And, and I always, you know, start, you know, this, there's an insight here that we don't acknowledge as, as healers, that to be a healer is really hard. This is not, this is not the reward for going to university for many years. It's hard, challenging work. It would challenge. Yes, yes. I, I, no doubt. And I, and I definitely, that was conveyed in some of your writings and your video transcripts online that, um, so you said now your work is really supporting the healer. Um, and in, in what way, I know that you're working uh, with movement related disorders, but in what way are you supporting healers? And I, you have, it sounds like you've done that throughout your career. Uh, yeah. but what is your primary focus now or where do you want to take that work? Well, where I want to take it and where it is, right. I'm the same thing. So, so the first thing is, you know, uh, I have a, I, I was actually just looking in preparation for our conversation. I'm actually writing a text um, and it's called The Practice, Contemplative Heart of Healing. And actually the first chapter is, is on learning by heart. And, and so 
for me, I, I, what's been really important to understand is not a, I know I was told at medical school that my job was to fix things. And right, not, right. it's not my job to fix things. It's my job to be available to anybody or anything that finds help, who finds what I have useful. So I, I, I used to be much more, <laughs> I, I, how can I, I always guess the word is arrogant. I mean, I, I really wanted to push stuff on systems and, and, and I, got a, I got learned very quickly that they push back twice as hard. So the, I, I, had, I got an insight um, many years ago, as I often share the story, I, I was leaving the hospital I mentioned earlier, where I had tried to get palliative med care going, and, um, I, and I was leaving the hospital, and, and nothing had really. I, I felt pretty. I was going down to Texas, and 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 I was kind of sad. And I was walking out the front entrance of the hospital the last time, and I bumped into a nurse, and and I had actually facilitated these um, every two weeks would have a a meeting of ICU nurses and there was no agenda other than just uh -huh. to show up and, and it, wonderful things came out of that. But yeah, but that's great. And, 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 I, and, I, and I, I, she said, oh, Jim, you're leaving. It's going to be, what are we going to do without you? And, and I said, to be honest, I, I'm not sure I accomplished anything at all. And, mm. and she looked at me and she said, you don't get it, do you? She said, you don't understand, the most important thing that you've done is to keep the conversation going. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, the moment we stop the conversation, then the lights go out, right? I mean, to paraphrase James Baldwin, and the sea comes rushing in. So I just see my work right now as just to support a conversation. And, and if hopefully we'll reach a time when people feel that conversation is important enough that they can't ignore it. Um, you know, the good news and, and the bad news, as I mentioned earlier, is that, you know, burnout has become everybody's problem and is threatening. Yeah. I would yeah. say it's threatening our entire culture, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, for better or worse. Um, I often refer to um, uh, you know, everybody's experience in burnout. This is not the purview of physicians or nurses or social workers or our entire society. If you look at the data, we're all we're all burning out. I, I, I have a talk, I call it the inner climate crisis, just as what's happening in our outer ecology. Yeah, that that's, a, that's a great uh, uh, title for a talk. Yeah, and, and so the, 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 that's the bad news. The good news is that this is now something that can't be avoided by people whose metrics is, is profit and prestige, right? So mm. outcome measures, if you're a hospital, if you're a hospital CEO, Burnout, and the data is very clear on this, burnout will negatively, very significantly negatively impact every metric that's important to you and by which you get measured. Um, and we can't, they can't avoid it anymore. The trouble is, is that they don't have a model that works. And there are a lot of really well-meaning, very smart people, um, including the, the National Academy of Medicine and, and folks at places like Stanford who are implementing things and they aren't working because they're, they're using the same consciousness to solve the problem that created it, right? So, right. so they're thinking that by changing systems, changing, changing workflows, by you know, having a scribe that walks behind me, taking notes so I don't have to engage with my electronic medical record as much is gonna solve the problem. Not, not having to work such long shifts. It is true that people can die of exhaustion, but what the data is showing is that these measures at best are making very marginal in positive impacts. In fact, what we're seeing is that the young people, the young people coming into the healing professions are the ones that are experiencing the most and the fastest burnout trajectory, right? Um, right, and I and I yeah, that's 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 uh, a really great point, and and you're right. It's not burnout is not limited to healthcare professionals or the healing professions. Right, no doubt. But our um, job, I just want to make a comment on that. Our job as sure. healers, our job as healers through our time, has been to identify the shadow of our community. Okay, and support our community in finding ways through that that will support their flourishing of both themselves and the environment. So if I am a shaman um, in, the, in the Amazon and the children are becoming sick with diarrhea, my role is to converse 
with some transcendent wisdom that helps me to understand that we are disrespecting nature by defecating in the river or disposing of things upstream that is poisoning the river and poisoning our children and that the way to flourishing is to be more respectful to our environment right so so um to how to get on that well, so, it's, well it's, it's very much um you know the vedic philosophy as well the inner and the outer and uh you know the uh the inner environment is reflected in our outer environment and vice versa. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, I think burnout is a topic. Um, I, I know you're integrating executive coaching with, um, obviously these issues are coming up, but in terms of your your work, your previous work, um, your years in, in the medical profession, if you were to think about burnout just in a general way, you know, what were the top three things that, I mean, you've, you've mentioned one obviously is to, to transcend mm -hmm. is, you know, and by transcending you're there's some hope that you can shift your paradigm, um, you know, change the way you look at things and, and the things you look at change. Um, but if you, if you were in general thinking about burnout, because this, this comes into play very much in a family caregiving situation as well. Uh, you know, and you, and you know, you get this kind of advice, like take care of yourself. Well, what does that mean? Take care of yourself. You know, flourishing is, is, um, so yeah, what, what, yeah. just some common yeah. things that you would, you would advise people to sure. start a practice of. So we, you know, our conversation is supposed to be focused on death and dying and being a caregiver, right? And so um, that's kind of, so I just went through my own story, like how working with people who are suffering, who may or may not be actively dying. You know, I, I just wanted to say, uh, Dr. Duffy, that um, I love the conversation we're having. So whatever direction it takes is, I think, eminently useful. Okay. So keep that in mind. Well, let me bring so let me bring it back to the death and the dying thing. Sure. So, and to your question about burnout, right? So um, ultimately, um, the one thing that mm, currently uh, medical genius cannot address is or prevent is dying. So in many ways, it's like the final frontier. It's where we can no longer avoid the, the avoid the reality, right? Um, so to go back to your question of um, burnout and the key factors, um, number one, um, I would say th there's actually two th to them, but number one is it's very clear to me that underlying all of this are, first of all, shame. Um, and that oh, shame, yeah. shame, shame. shame and shame is the inevitable consequence of trauma, right? So- And when you say shame, do you mean that I'm not measuring up? Yeah, so shame is this a belief, um, this experience that I am not enough, right? And we can right. take that in many different directions. Right. You know, I, I sometimes feel like I am raised just basically a shame doctor, I mean, you know, people like, but you know, we didn't even talk about shame until really Brene Brown came out with it and her TED, TEDx talk, right? And God bless right. her. You know, I could talk about just about anything over the dining room table in San Francisco and people would keep a conversation going, either negatively or positively. You bring up the word shame and it'll shut any conversation down. And yet sh shame is driving, shame is driving us our lives and, and when we experience shame if we're not perfect we're not enough and anger that we have to continue to produce the goods in order to be accepted so this is really you know when i when i work with physicians particularly in retreat um, this concept of shame inevitably must must be brought to the surface before we make progress um, mm. The second thing is we need to, f we don't feel connected to each other, right? And yeah, well, we're, we're disconnected with, with ourselves and we're disconnected right. with each other. Yeah. You know, and loneliness uh, has become a pandemic. You know, in England, right. they have the Minister of Loneliness. 
I think they might have just shut it down the minister, the department actually, but but because they couldn't find a solution. But but well, so, that, well that, that's that's also Deepak Chopra's organization, Never Alone Love. Okay, I didn't know that one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. So you know, that came about as a result of the you know during the pandemic in terms of okay yeah the rates, yeah. Of, the rates of suicide and um, that loneliness was really um, at the at the was really the crux. Yeah. Of, of that so and to go back to my definite you know so it was it was i guess it was funny i mean the nurses when i was doing palliative care used to say and i come on the unit they say here comes dr duffy bringing all the suffering with him oh ho, 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 and I'd say, well you know it was already you know, i'm just trying to i'm trying to help with this but you know but just by bringing it myself into the room i was putting suffering on the table and so connection yeah and that's and that's you know um you, that's a very good point because I think sometimes people don't want to, um, in terms of the Buddhist journey and in, in terms of exploring the teachers, they hear suffering and it's like they hear they hear death and dying and and they're and it's they're repelled by that. Right. Um, so, um, but yeah, I mean, um, but obviously there's there's the other side of that, you know, transforming the suffering. Right. Um, so, so this is great. So burnout, shame, trauma. So, you know, so the, the three pillars would be, um, uh, and actually this was interesting, this kind of aligns with some of the more recent work building on Abe Maslow's, you know, everybody's heard of Maslow's, you know, right, the hierarchy of needs. Yeah, nobody really knows what that means, right? Self-actualization, <laughs> we will talk about it, but um, actually yeah. uh, Scott Barry Kaufman's work on tr what his book called Transcend, I think this is a beautiful job um, really distilling um, and building on Maslow's work. He, he spent a lot of time you know, studying Maslow's unpublished writings, his notebooks, etc. cetera. Um, Maslow never actually used words like self-actualization, but what Scott has, Barry Kaufman has done is that, you know, at the root of the sailboat is the hull, which is built on self-esteem, we have to have self-esteem to stay afloat on the, on the river of life, right? Very mm -hmm. Vedic concept, right? The river of life. We have to be able to stay afloat before we can do anything else. And so, well, so I think that's, um, you know, it's kind of like putting your own oxygen mask on first. And it, and it's very much the, the Buddhist tradition as well. The, the you know, you start with the, um, the Hinayana and then, yeah. you know, first working on, yeah. but, it, but it's not just, and then when when there's the capacity and the capability being able to to help others yeah but it's even beyond that because actually uh, that even that concept is driven by um non-cherishing of yourself i mean so it's really the sense that oh, i am enough um that are in, in actually there is data now which i show in my talks on shame it mostly comes out of australia working with nurses there actually is a direct correlation between it's called self-valuation scale, self-valuation scale. There actually is a direct correlation between how high you score on that and how high you score on your burnout. So the less self-valuation self you have, the more likely you are to be burned out. So that's the, so that word shame, self-esteem, right? Shame, self. The next pillar of, or the blank in the boat is this idea of being connected. This is, of course, in Buddhism, this would be the Sangha, right? that the Sangha that was, because actually nobody can do it alone, okay? Um, Obama reminded of that, thus of that number of years ago with one of his, his speeches, right? I mean, we need a Sangha because we actually, when we're a Sangha, we become a distributed field that can actually absorb and work with these energies far more efficiently than just one rigid um nodal point right so and of course within healthcare but within the whole of society we have no sangha i can tell you that um as a physician i am totally alone mm -hmm. physician i am totally alone that when you're totally would tell me what you mean by that that i do my work alone and if something goes wrong and by the way, I work in the field of catastrophes. I work in the field, you know, it was amazing that, you know, actually I never had less stress than I, when I worked as a palliative medicine physician. 
because actually there was no expectation, expectation that I was going to fix anything, right? And when something goes wrong, particularly if an error has been made, and every human being, no matter how smart, how diligent, how trustworthy, whatever, we are not perfect. When a mistake happens, you are on your own, on your own. And the first advice you'll get from risk management is don't tell anybody about this or discuss it with anyone, especially the family. Well, I mean, there's so many stakeholders and everybody is, uh, and that's true in medicine as well as in, but obviously the, the stakes are higher in medicine, yeah. you know, uh, and, you know, you have families pointing the finger, um, you have um, the institutions and, you know, like the risk management issues. So there's just, yeah. They're alone and you, and, and physicians become depressed when they're sued, well, two thirds of, of them develop a depression. Yeah, I can guarantee absolutely. They would not become depressed if they had a supportive community that held them and said, we understand how hard this work is and we've right. been there and we're going to be there for you. Not, yeah, not and to I, to bury problem, bury mistakes, but to be supportive and say, oh, we made a mistake. We're human beings. Exactly, exactly. There, there's uh, little um, understanding for error. Um, and... I actually, one thing I, I did want to touch on, and I want to, I want to come back to this, but you talked about the healing profession um, as a sadhana, you know, that this is a, this is a practice right. and uh, perhaps that's one way to um, restore the heart of the healer uh, and to combat burnout. Yeah. you. I mean, this is, so this is exactly what I'm spending my energy on right now is what I had this insight many years ago when we would have these retreats, place wonderful places like Esalen, when I would go to these wonderful places as a retreatant, right, or Buddhist retreat, I felt fantastic when I left there. It was wonderful. Things were oh, going to be yeah. good, right? And I'd get back to the well, Especially a beautiful place like Esalen. Right, absolutely. I get back to the, back to my workplace, and by lunchtime, I was more despondent than I'd ever been before. And so were the people that had just been on the retreat, because we'd had a sense of what was possible, and yet it didn't translate into the consciousness of our everyday world. So to go back to your point, which for me was a light bulb, is oh my goodness, healing needs to become a sadhana. It needs to become a spiritual practice. And so um, what I teach now, uh, how I teach this stuff, and, and it's not a solution to everything. The, you know, there's, no, there was, no. I think it was Peter, Peter Drucker who said, a bad system will beat a good person every time, right? So, so we need <laughs> to work within systems. But yeah. it's, if you, in order to love the work, you have to love the work, right? And so what I noticed, have noticed throughout my career is the more quote, quote unquote successful you are as a physician, the fewer patients you see. <laughs> yeah, it's very okay. interesting. Sorry? Tell me, what, what does that mean? The more successful you are, the fewer patients you see? No, like if in academics, for example, right? Or if you're right. in a health organization, you move into more administrative roles. And of course, the ultimate, oh, yeah. I'm the chair of the department. I mean, I work with chairmen who haven't seen a patient literally in 10 years, and yet they give talks on how to work with the treatment resistant depression, right? And yet they haven't seen anybody for 10 years, but their success, right? They, so, right? so we have to make the work meaningful. And we have, so this is my, what I call the yoga of medicine, yoga of medicine. Oh, oh so yoga you, of medicine. So you'll that, like, sounds like the, that sounds like the title of a book. Yeah, and it's like seven sessions, and a lot of it captures what we've talked about. Um, and by doing the work, this way, the work becomes enlivening and not yeah. draining, right? Yeah, yeah, because it's, uh, uh, and, and that relates to the stress and the burnout. Yeah, and I think we can use the yoga of medicine, the yoga of CEO, the yoga of law, the yoga, I mean, this is the sudden, this is the contemplative application of our work, right? Um, contemplation, right. I love that word contemplation. So, but rather than simply saying, oh, now that you know, I mean, these are specific um, attitudes, skill sets that we develop. We, you just, you know, you have to work on these. My Buddhist um, tradition teaches me, you know, you have to do the work. You have to sit on the cushion. 
Yeah, you have to say snondra. You have to say a certain. You have to spend time sitting with impermanence, meditating on impermanence. That's the great teaching of death, right? Impermanence, right? Sitting with that. What does that really mean, right? So, so it's not just in you know, a kind of a scenic route. While you know, if you. But having said that, it needs to be instrumentalized, just as within your tradition and within my tradition. The sadhana is instrument, it's actually instrumentalized. It's actually, these are things that we do as a ritual, okay? These are Yeah, yeah, the sadhana, I, like, I love the word um, instrumentalized, implemented. I mean, you, you have to have uh, specific practices without, you know, sounding too esoteric. Huh. Um, uh, and, they, and they have to be regular. So let me give you an example, you know, the... Sure. So it's a seven. I have currently I have a seven session version of this. I, I've taught it twice in the last six months. I'm about to teach it again, actually, wonderfully to my own group. Um, but uh, it, the first you, of mm -hmm. you've taught it to physicians specifically. Um, I thought everybody basically. I find that actually um, physicians are the toughest nuts because they're so sure. the shame is so intense and the need to be in yeah. control and perfect. So vulnerability is Brene. Brown teaches us is the, is 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 when you have shame you can't be vulnerable, but any yeah. it's actually anybody can do it. But it's, it's seven sessions, and so um, there are seven different. Um, you as, I call them the asanas of medicine, right? And a really asana just describes posture, right? It's a relationship to things, and an asana is not about what we do; it's who we are in that position, right? And so the first of the asanas. Of the yoga of medicine is to have clarity and specificity around our intention for our work right and so we spend an hour and a half kind of working around this concept of intention right and it's a lot of fun and we work with to different traditions and a lot of you know i love Sadhguru, for example i think so oh yeah He's so wonderfully relevant to the 21st century. Well, we work with these. I have Jim Carrey is a frequent, you know, guest, quote unquote, and he has some wonderful okay. teachings on there on intention. But and then at the end of that session, people have actually created an intention statement for their life, for their work. Okay. And, and so what we do, and I this listen, this is what I try to do. I'm not do I don't certainly don't do it perfectly, and I'm often distracted from it. But whenever I have a really difficult decision, it becomes really simple when I go back to my intention. You know, what is my yeah. intention? And if my right, intention, right. And there probably is a universal intention statement for healers, although it can be languaged differently. It's pretty much ends up the same for all of us. But mm -hmm. if I go back to that, okay, this is my North Star. When I'm getting yeah. lost in those tumultuous storms of life, Right, and this right. person is bringing up stuff for me that's really hard. Like, mm -hmm. you know, should I let you walk out of this room when you're having suicidal sta statements? Mm -hmm. Hard one, right? Or do I simply... That's, yeah, that's, that's a tough one. Yeah. Do I just instrumentalize this into some bureaucracy that it says if you score more than X or Y on a suicide scale, I call the security to take you away and, and put you on a hold for 72 hours? That's instrumentalizing, but it may not be consistent with my deep intention for you, right? Sure. sure. Or do I accept? Or, 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 or your deepest intention for your own work. Correct. Or when I'm sitting with somebody who's saying, who's saying, you know, and I've had this conversation so many times with a patient who's sitting with me and saying, you know, doc, I'm done with the chemotherapy. I've given it a shot. I, I don't want to do this anymore. I, I want to have quality and not poor quantity of life and I don't want to do this but what does that mean I mean how am I going to work with my family how am I going to work let them know that I'm not giving up I'm simply just changing my focus if I'm clear about my intention for them right that conversation becomes a lot more understandable right, um, right. and so honestly what are the, all of this is about is stuff that we should be learning I call this a noetic education noetic coming from the Greek gnosis, right? Which really is about no, ways of knowing, way, being in the world, living in that world of first person perspective, rather than the world of scientific materialism or bureaucracy, right? And legal regulations, right? 
it's this is the this is our experience and so we're all having this but we have no framework so so that's the yoga of medicine and 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 so people at the end of it can say you know i have these seven asanas and so as i and we i combine behavioral design theory the same theory that got us hooked on our telephones bj fog etc right we use these principles as rituals that get incorporated into the clinical encounter that transform it and guess what nobody can even see you doing it uh, and i'm just really happy because I've just been invited to present this work at the International Conference on Clinical Skills in a few months. And it's the first time where, you know, I, I had a dean once tried really hard to, to get this into the curriculum. And the dean of students kept saying, we, there's nothing we can displace that, is, that this is not important enough to make it part of our curriculum. We need more hours spent on renal kidney physiology. You know, which of course, you know, it's like we all forget right. it. As soon as we learn it, we forget it. If we, I, I don't use much kidney physiology. I could have learned it in one lecture. What's relevant to my work as a prescribing psychiatrist, right? Or neuropsychiatrist. Right. So, so I'm really happy that maybe, you know, but once again, it's not about me telling the world or my community what it needs. It's about just holding a space right. where right. when things are ready, they will manifest and 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 what you know going back to end of life care just i want to make just two comments about that number one is well, that well the, the holding space also is um in end of life and and other aspects of medicine the, the power of presence correct yeah and and you use that word i don't know if it's an actual word but i love it anyway the synchrony mm-hmm yeah, you know the, the 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 synchrony, the connection that uh, starts to the transformative nature of that. Yeah, the resonance that happens that we are all yeah. in the process of co-creating each other. I mean, this is Vedic philosophy, right? So yes, and of course Deepak Chopra speaks so eloquently about this. But that word presence really was what when I heard. I know we're running out of time, but the very my very first engagement with hospice was being asked to to sit in for one of my colleagues who was the hospice medical director was going on vacation. They used to meet on the floor above us in the, in the hospital. And he said, Jim, can you just sit in on next week's meeting? All you have to do is show up and sign forms. Um, that's all you do as the medical director. I said, sure, I can do that. I went up there, I list the first case, the hospice nurse presented the case. The case was Mr. Jones um, is, is actively dying from his lung cancer. Um, he is comfortable. He's not in distress. His family are comfortable. Um, we were present. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Smile and move on to the next case. I said, hold on. I just, excuse me. Uh, you said you were present. I, what do you mean you were present? What, what? And they just looked at me and smiled, which was the right response. So this idea of presence, right, central, but it's also central to being part of a community that we have, we need to actually begin to see each other again, right? And I have lots of stories about that. We have become invisible to each other. And, and yes, we see each other on television, right? But we're not actually seeing each other. And, and before we, and so until we can see each other, we really can't, we can't make progress. And I just want to go back to the, this is a really important lesson, I think, um, about end of life care and palliative medicine. The good news is that within the space of 15 years, palliative medicine went from something you couldn't even volunteer to do in hospitals to more than 90% of hospitals having palliative care services. That's the great, wonderful news. Things can change and they can change really quickly. Right, right, here's, yeah. Here's, here's the tough news. Mm -hmm is that the field has been held captive to the very thing that we use to justify its growth, which is that we were able to demonstrate that by using, utilizing palliative care approaches, we could reduce, end of, we could reduce hospital day bed use, we could reduce ICU bed use, and we therefore could reduce expenditures and the profit margin per diagnostic category would therefore increase. And what that meant is that we have now instrumentalized end of life care to the point where hospices, nonprofit hospices are an endangered species and rapidly disappearing. 
and that the vast, and there's articles about this, there was an article about this in the New Yorker last year, that nonprofit hospitals are being displaced by corporations whose agenda is profit. And, and I, this is something, this is the consciousness, right? This is the metric. And it's a metric right. organized around the simple principle of scarcity versus abundance. And that as long as, as long as we as a community continue to experience the universe as a place of scarcity where there is not enough to go around, okay, we will continue these patterns. And that whatever we do, whether it's end of life care, whether it's the yoga of medicine, you know, I can take, I can take yoga of medicine as a really good way to improve metrics, right? But that can't be the soul of the work, right? So um, we have to be really diligent and careful about that. And, 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 and of course, our dying, our, our teachers, they're, they're teaching us about impermanence, about abundance. They're teaching us about the limitations of scientific materialism. They're teaching us about the nature of suffering. They're teaching us about community. You know, George Hegel, the, the 20th century German philosopher, 19th century said, history is the story of how we have cared for our dying, right? Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you know, when I see in, in the Tibetan community how they care for their dying, I mean, it's just truly uh, to go to a community of refugees in India and to see how they care for their dying in, in the middle of their community, not something to be avoided as, a, as an uncomfortable reminder of impermanence, but something to be embraced, right? As a teacher, right, they don't, they don't, they don't shuttle them away. They don't. Yeah. And they, they, yeah. they, they make them central to the community. You know, yeah. there's several of refugee communities in India where they've built retirement homes, right? Retirement communities in the central of, of their of their land to support their elders, right? That elder people are not a nuisance; they're a source of wisdom. They're not an. Absolutely. They're not, not something that you know. Tyson Junker Porter, the Aboriginal philosopher who wrote a book called Sand Lines, wonderful, wonderful indigenous wisdom. He says that civilizations always seek ways to, um, uh, to farm out the entropy or externalize entropy, right? To externalize things that reduce the efficiency and their capacity to reap abundance from whatever they have, whether it be in the abuse of other uh, the communities, whether it be in slavery, whether it be through war, right? And, and so we find these ways and things that slow us down, things that, that you know, reduce profit margins, make us uncomfortable, right? We find ways of trying to, we'll ship that off. Old people, yeah, yeah, I love that. I, I, I love that uh, phrase, to farm out entropy. That's just, uh, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's uh, yeah. So thank you for that. Well, um, I know we're we're running to time here. We're over time, so I want to be respectful of your time, um, mm -hmm. Dr. Duffy. But what I would like to um, perhaps end with is you've indicated that in some ways, part of your journey has been you became interested in storytelling. Um, and in, in some ways, this is a story of our of our collective consciousness, our individual consciousness. Um, but where do you see that attribute or that, you know, your your proclivity for that? Where do you see that taking you? I know you've talked about possibly, uh, I don't know if you're prepared to talk about your own podcast or what you'd like to do with that. Um, yeah, good question, right? I mean, as you can see from my... <laughs> My appearance, I mean, I'm at that retirement, retirement stage, right? And so even that word is really uncomfortable. I, I don't know. I think, you know, I th what I've learned as a, as a physician and working with people uh, with incurable diseases and, and the dying is actually, well, only thing I have, only thing I have authority over is my intention. That's why it's the first of the asanas, right? That's the only thing I have. Everything else is a universal crapshoot, right? And I have my fate driven by my own karma, the planets, the, the universe, whatever, that brings me stuff. And then it's up to me 
to work with that in a way that's aligned with my intention. So, you know, what's interesting, you know, every other, not every, I would, most cultures um, have identified, there is a roadmap for when you're older, right? If I was in India, um, at least in- Right, the four ashram, the, yeah. the uh, four stages of life and- right, Yeah, I mean, it would um, be very clear, my roadmap. I, there is I, no roadmap and I just move from the Bay Area um, the center of genius. What I discovered there was that wisdom is an annoyance. In because, in in the bay in the Bay Area. Absolutely, because you know the Bay Area has become a value free zone, and it's all about it, it, what we could do, not what we should do. And wisdom is about the what should we do, not what could we do, right? Oh, that's wonderful! I love that. Yeah, and, so, and do you see do you see Connecticut as a different uh, as a more fertile ground? Hmm. I see Connecticut as a wonderful place with people who, I mean, of course, Connecticut is more than one state. I mean, if you move of down course. to the south, yeah. I mean, yeah. we are, I mean, I, I have a, a, a child who lives in Fairfield County, who sure. sure. lives in a world of high finance and, and ex extravagance. Um, it, Connecticut is all of those things. California is all of those things. It's, yeah, yeah. So, but the dominant, there is no dominant culture within Connecticut. Yeah, that, that but, is true. But that there's clearly true. people that are fully bought into the samsaric identity of the 21st century. And there's people who are living in the woods. Um, you know, I think right. Walton could have had a great time anyway in most of Connecticut. He didn't need to be in Massachusetts. But, but, yeah. so, but to go back to your question, you know, at this point in my life, having the humility of understanding that I don't control fate, that all I can do is be clear about my intention and open to what the universe brings me. Having said that, like recognizing that ultimately the work on myself will determine how I relate to and work with what fate brings me. And, and you know, the final part of that journey is dying, right? To go back to our topic. And, and, and I just like to you know, that one of my teachers, Tenzin Wanjal Rinpoche, Tenzin Wanjal Rinpoche, um, he has a story about his teacher, Lopon. Uh, and Lopon, who's now 95, I think, um, he talked a number of years ago about going to visit Lopon when Lopon was in his late 80s, mid 80s. And, um, and he, Lopon said to Tenzin Wanjal, he says, you know, while I'm all ready, my bags are packed. He says, I'm ready for the next journey, dying. He says, I've done mm. already. Mm -hmm. okay. There's, he's ready. And that's kind of where we all need to be putting our energy, being ready by doing our own work. And, you know, I, I of course, you know, uh, Lopin is, he's ready. I mean, he's done the work, right? I mean, he's, right. he's, he's, he's uh, um, you know, it's like Pima Chodron's book, How You Live is How You Die, yeah. you know, her new book. Yeah. And in some way, it's in a kind of weird, right? They've kind of instrumentalized the stages of dissolution, but they've not so much instrument, they've given you, you have choices about how you want to work with them, but they've actually described the, those Tibetan, in, what you might call intronauts, right? There's, they've, they've been explorers of the internal world and the process. They've actually described the journey for us. And they've also described for us how at each point of that journey, we can get hooked back into that same yeah. business, right? Sure, sure. Yeah, and that's my. Yeah, that's exactly. the work, right? I mean, that is the right. work. And right. if I if well, they you... say it, it, just to, along those lines, they say that the very evolved yogis that um, it's the same kind of thing. My 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 bags are packed. I'm ready to go. Yeah, and the other profound insight, of course, is that every second, you know, between every out breath and in breath, there is the bardo, right? Right. That's the, right. Within that, and so every moment you and I are in a transition and it's really helpful to know where we are in that, <laughs> that geography. And so if I don't, so I don't know what the world's gonna, what fate brings me and I can't get hung up on what it, whether it brings me what I think I deserve or need or whatever, what I need to work on is is what who what who I am uh, in that journey, right? And so, um, getting back to the power of intention, intention and be, right? being really and having 
being clear and specific. Yeah, and I want to just finish with, with one. So the final asana, I want to leave with this point. The final asana is the experience of joy. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. Actually, it's, the, it's actually the sixth one. It's not the final one. So, so it's the experience, being able to experience, live in that asana of joy. And so I have to tell you that probably the most beauty I've experienced in my life is bearing witness to peaceful passage of beautiful beings who have passed. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I Peaceful passage, I, I love that, oh, that phrase so, as well. So much beauty there, right? And so, you know, it's, it's the beauty that makes it possible for us all to show up, whether it's as healers or whether it's as a, as a stone cutter who's experiencing the beauty of the art, creating a stone that goes into the cathedral that's being built in, in homage and, and, and devotion to, 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 to a God, whatever is a beauty, right? Beauty, beauty. And so, uh, you, know, I, I off, you know, I often say that, you know, the one of the worst things that we can do, and this is what happens in healthcare, is teach our children that ugliness is normal. Ugliness is not normal. Beauty is normal. That, and that's, we essentially need to become apprentices to that. And so as we get older, the good news is we have that capacity to apprentice ourselves to beauty um, and not to get hooked into the ugliness of, you know, the, 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 the news channels, right? I think about a song from Jim Morrison, right? American, uh, what was called an American dream, right? So we, we get hooked into beauty, ugliness. It's ugliness everywhere. So, so um, it's, to, you know, the Navajo path to beauty, right? And beauty around me, beauty before me, beauty behind me, beauty below me, I walk in beauty, it is finished in beauty. So, so if we as healers, if we as human beings can open to beauty, um, beauty is interesting word, right? But I, I love the Navajo, each, each culture has its own words for beauty and that's part of what we talk about in, and the program is, you know, I love ho 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 ho. I'm now pronouncing it wrong with apologies, H O. Right. Which really is that Navajo experience of beauty in the sublime synchrony and 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 and, and harmony of the of the universe, right? And so, when we experience that place in the universe um, beyond the dissonance, you know, of our trauma and getting stuck and yada yada. yada can we really open up into abundance that's where we experience beauty right and so yeah beautiful um, beautiful yeah so that's kind they, of, they go they go hand in hand the yeah, they do the capacity to experience beauty appreciate beauty and um yeah uh, that you know evokes the feeling of abundance yeah we and, become abundant yeah yeah so. it's very vedic i guess i you know and uh but it's um yeah, so it's a journey. We're all on the journey. Um, and we've come under this delusion that somehow we have a control over it. The only thing we have control over is how we relate to what fate has washed us up on, what shore this is, which is partly our own doing and our lineage and, and whatever, right? And some mysterious plan. Um, but, and, and you know better than I do about, you know, it's this types of consciousness and you know, identity consciousness and, and, and chitta and the sense thieves that we experience as consciousness and the manas of, 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 of kind of memory routine. That sure. These are all sure. different forms of attachment. It's, it, it, it's, um, it, it is a practice to um, start the process of unraveling all of that, yeah. you know. Yeah. So. It's a practice. Wonderful. Yeah. No doubt. Right. Well, um, if uh, viewers and listeners, if anyone wants to reach out to you, do you, is there a good way to be in touch or um, would you like me? I can include contact information if you'd like on the. Um... Yeah. Why don't you do that? I'm, you know, I'm not obviously available to be doing sure. therapy online and stuff. Yeah, like, of course. Yeah. Um, and that's hard, obviously not, often a very hard, difficult line to know where you're working with that. Um, sure. but if people have specific questions you know, about burnout about you know strategies for that um, sure yeah all right awesome well thank you so much